let's go ahead and get started um, <clears throat> for all of our clients who are who have joined and those who are still joining. We have been given this excellent opportunity uh, to speak with two true experts in the field of private credit from Nuveen and Churchill. Um, just to get a little bit more comfortable with what private credit is, how it's responding to the markets, how it's different than more traditional bonds. We'll try to keep it pretty brief, cap it at 30 minutes, um, max hard stop. But if anyone has any questions that arise as Ken and Kelly are talking, put them into the, the questions um, box and we have people monitoring and we'll, we'll try to be able to answer those towards the end. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Natalie Colley. I'm a senior lead advisor here at Francis Financial, and I'm joined today by my colleague and fellow lead advisor, Shweta Lawande. Uh, and we, of course, have our experts, Ken Kensell and Kelly Marti. Ken is president and CEO of Churchill Asset Management. He was one of the original founders of uh, Churchill Financial Group, and in addition to being serving as president and CEO of Churchill Asset Management, he regularly appears as an expert uh, in, uh, in private credit markets on Bloomberg, CNBC, Wall Street Journal, and the Financial Times. So definitely an expert in the industry. And Kelly Marti, also an expert senior managing director and in portfolio investment strategy. And she serves as head of PCAP's portfolio management, overseeing day-to-day -day investment activity and helping to make ongoing regular investment decisions for the funds. Thank you both so, so much for joining us today and for your time. Our pleasure. Thanks, Emily. Great. Um, I just wanted to start off by mentioning for all of our clients who have heard us refer to private credit through a variety of names. You might have heard of Nuveen, Churchill, PCAP is, is another way we've used to refer to the fund. Um, when we use these names, what we're talking about specifically is the Nuveen Churchill Private Capital Income Fund. So if you hear us use these names throughout the conversation, please know that we're referring to this one fund. Um, and with that, I would love to start by asking, you know, what is private credit and where do you see it fitting into a portfolio? Sure, great. Well, it's a great question. And thank you all for, for having us here today. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think to, to understand what private credit is, maybe it helps to have a little bit of a, of, of a backstory and a little bit of history on, on how we got here today and, and why private credit has become so prominent. Um, you can't go many places today and not hear about private credit. So um, obviously, uh, having been involved in investing in private companies and, and direct lending for uh, nearly 40 years now, it's nice to see our uh, turn in the spotlight. We're certainly getting a lot of attention. But essentially, what it refers to in the case of, of what we do at Churchill, and I, and I think for um, the, the vast majority of, of private credit managers, it really refers to providing regular way senior lending, effectively lending that historically the banks, um, the traditional banks have done. If you went back 20 years ago and you looked at the kind of lending we do, it would have been the loans that have been made by Chase Manhattan and JP Morgan and our Chemical Bank and Bankers Trust and other large money center banks. And as the, the markets have evolved, uh, that role of providing regular way senior loans to high quality, mid-sized US companies has now become the province of private capital managers, direct lenders, who as opposed to bank funding and deposits are actually raising the capital from individual and institutional investors. Uh, today at Churchill, for example, we annually invest um, uh, over $10 billion in US middle market companies. These are high quality businesses in areas like software and healthcare, and business services, market leading companies um, owned or backed by large private equity investment firms uh, that have a strategy of growing those businesses. And um, uh, we have today over 250 portfolios uh, companies you know, in our investment portfolio, and we seek to invest in these high quality businesses. What's very attractive about private credit today and why I think investors have focused on it, both institutional and um, um, and retail investors is that it provides strong current income. Uh, it provides a floating rate 
uh, nature. So in a rising rate environment, um, our investors uh, don't have to worry about uh, inflation risk because our loans are, are adjustable based on uh, rising rates. Um, and they provide non-correlated uh, investments to the public equity market. So, um, and of course, um, probably most importantly today, they provide all of that at probably the most attractive terms and structure that we've seen in many years. So direct lending has gotten very popular. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of institutional interest in investing in direct lending managers. Uh, we ourselves have raised over $30 billion in the last three years to focus on direct lending. And we have many large you know, U.S. insurance companies, um, uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds have invested in this um, strategy in addition to individual investors. So it's become very popular. And um, today, the overall direct lending market is about $1.5 trillion in size. So it's a very large market. Um, and it's become, you know, uh, in many respects, the go-to financing for larger, mid, larger and middle, middle market companies. And, you know, maybe we can take a, even a step back. That was a really excellent explanation of the private credit market, but maybe even higher level. Uh, how is private credit different than more traditional bonds? Sure. Well, if you think about private credit, what sets it apart from uh, whether you're talking about bonds, high yield bonds, for example, or, or even syndicated bank loans, is that our loans are directly originated by ourselves and other private credit managers. So we are structuring those transactions with significant financial covenants, financial protections for ourselves and our investors. Um, we are structuring those loans to be floating rate. Uh, traditionally, the bond market, certainly the high yield bond market is fixed rate. Uh, so in a rising rate environment, um, you can be subject to interest rate risk, whereas in our case, all of our loans are floating rate. Uh, and so in that sense, there's a, a very significant fundamental difference from the bond market. But but more importantly, in a, in a private market like ours, all of our loans <coughs> are valued um, by fundamental credit. All of our loans are valued by a third party um, and they're valued based on fundamental credit. So investors in our funds are getting essentially a look through to the fundamental value of every single loan in our portfolio, not a trading value that might be whipsawed and move around quite a bit based on liquidity or illiquidity in the market, but actual fundamentals. So um, because our loans aren't publicly traded, because they are um, in that more volatile marketplace, um, you get um, a lot more stability in values and valuations and a lot more transparency in the underlying assets themselves. Um, we get full access to financial statements, all the information from these companies, ongoing reporting, traditional financial covenants. Most companies today that issue in the bond market uh, or even the syndicated loan market, those are the publicly traded markets, there are no um, uh, there are no traditional financial covenants. So, so we have a lot more protections, if you will, in our market that are built into the structure. Um, and of course, um, as I mentioned, all of our loans are floating rate uh, and therefore uh, provide um, fundamental protection against inflation. Okay. I, I would add one other feature as well to the senior loans that we invest in, in particular in PCAP. When a company earns cash flow, our loans are the first to be repaid with that cash flow, whereas a bond that's issued by a company is, is the second to be repaid. So if you're senior at the top of the capital structure, that's going to give you a priority as far as repayment. So that's another attractive feature to the loans we invest in. So that's what Ken was referring to when he was talking about there being more protections for private loans than, say, more traditional bond funds. Absolutely. And Kelly, can you maybe provide us a, a couple examples of some of the companies that the Nuveen Churchill Private Credit um, Fund loans to? So yeah, absolutely. Feel? Yeah. So as Ken mentioned, we're focused on what we define as the traditional middle market. And we, we, we include companies generating cash flows between 10 and 100 million per year when we're defining our market. So it's a very broad market. To be um, more specific, there's about 200,000 businesses in the United States that fit those characteristics. So there's a lot of white space in the market. And we're seeing these, these businesses and these transaction opportunities directly from our private equity sponsor partners. So a lot of white space to be 
um, taken advantage of in the market, which is a good thing for the growth of Churchill and particularly for PCAP. Mm -hmm. But to give a couple of examples of businesses that we've financed recently, um, there's one that comes to mind that's interesting because it's based in New York. This company was established in 1999, so it's been in business a little over 24 years. And the business model is pretty simple. This company makes signs. So they make speed limit signs, stop signs. They even make the signs that you would see outside of a coffee shop, that, that chalkboard sign that you'll see on the sidewalk yeah, um, yeah. with the menu of the day. They make those signs mm -hmm. as well. So they have many, many customers there's a very diverse base of, of revenues for this business, but we liked it particularly because there's a very strong management team, the private equity firm that purchased this business we have a long history with, and we trust them and respect them. And this company has a very outstanding financial performance. So that's one example of a business that really fits all of the Churchill credit boxes, things that we like to see, established track record, trusted management team, relationship with the private equity sponsor, strong historical performance, and a very valid reason to exist. I mean, those stop signs and speed limit signs are being replaced regularly. So this company has a recurring revenue that we like to see. So that's a good example of a company that we've financed recently. Another one that comes to mind is a company in the janitorial space. So not quite as, as, as sexy of a company, but an interesting story because janitorial Janitorial services are very necessary and they're non-deferrable. You have to spend this money. So this company in particular does the janitorial services for schools, retail stores, and malls. So again, a very fixed base of, of revenue recurring and, and non-deferrable by nature. So that's another characteristic we like to see. Again, a very strong management team, a private equity sponsor that we know and have a long-term relationship with. So that's another business that we've invested in very recently. And I would say, uh, just to follow up on Kelly's point, and Kelly, those are great examples. You know, when you think about the industries that we like and the types of companies that we like to finance, these are both great examples. Market leaders, um, strong historical, stable cash flow, um, strong management teams, um, a, a business that has a very clear reason to exist and is an important ongoing um, uh, part of its its clients or its customers uh, ecosystem, if you will. Um, and, and what's further interesting about our model is that as an investment firm, we've established longstanding and very strong relationships in the private equity community. So we, we historically have only dealt with companies that are owned or controlled by private investment firms that we know, that we've done significant business with, that have a very strong historical track record of generating solid returns to their investors, many of whom have never in their history had a loss or a default in their portfolio. So we know they work very well with their lenders. And in a typical transaction for us, last quarter, great example, the average equity contribution, amount of equity they put in a transaction has been about 65% equity, right? So Think about the housing market. How would you feel about, you know, lending to a, to a mortgage where you have 65% equity in your average transaction? So we're typically lending about 30 to 40% loan to value. So you've got tremendous underlying value in the companies that we lend to. So our structures tend to be much more conservative than the liquid loan market or even the public bond market which might have 80% loan to value or 70% loan to value as opposed to 35 or 40% loan to value. So in addition to financial covenants, in addition to the underlying um, uh, nature of the loans we make, uh, the conservative structures of what we do and the types of companies we invest in, very differentiated relative to, for example, a bond fund or, or a liquid loan fund. So what I'm hearing is these are very like stable, uh, yeah. generating cash flow, mid-sized companies. They're not necessarily large enough and going public. They're still privately held, but they need some influx of cash to help them grow and kind of reach that next level. Yes, so, and also, so oh. I, I was just going to say, and they're also, I would say, we typically do not focus on very small companies either, right? So, to, you know, our typical company in our portfolio today uh, has about 75 million in cash flow. So these are good sized businesses. These are not 
micro cap size companies. These are 50, 75 million. That's our typical company in our portfolio. So these are companies that need upwards of 250 million to 750 million of financing. So these are good sized companies, market leading businesses, but they're just not large enough to have graduated into that syndicated loan market where underlying leverage, underlying structures tend to be more aggressive. So we stay more conservative. We stay with good sized companies, but companies maybe that that are you know quite large enough to have you know graduated, if you will, into that liquid loan or bond market. And, and you bring up a good point, Natalie, as far as what is the use of proceeds? What are what is this debt going to finance? When we're coming into a new transaction, the main purpose of the debt that we're providing is to help finance a leverage buyout. So it's a private equity sponsor looking at this business, seeing its attractive characteristics, choosing to purchase that business, and then aligning with Churchill to provide the debt. So it really, if you think about the the assets in our portfolio, it's gone through two very distinct layers of due diligence. So the private equity sponsor is looking at all of those businesses, those 200,000 businesses in the middle market space and saying, this is the one I want to buy. And so they've done that level of, of scrutiny. Then they look, but then they come to Churchill and we see many different transactions from these sponsors that we then get to diligence and choose from. And then we approve about 5% of those businesses. So by the time a new loan comes into the Churchill portfolio, it's been vetted through two very rigorous processes as far as why this business is a good business to finance and why it deserves to be in the Churchill and the PCAP portfolio. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm wondering, Kelly, as more companies seem to be staying private for longer, mm -hmm. particularly with today's IPO market, how is that impacting the opportunity set amongst these companies that you guys are doing diligence for? Yeah. So the opportunity set is is wider, right? To, to Ken's earlier point, typically businesses that are in that $75 million cash flow range might have the opportunity to go to that syndicated market and get financing there. But because that market, for all intents and purposes, has been closed for about 18 to 20 months now, those businesses, very high quality, strong cash flow businesses that typically may have transacted in the syndicated market are staying in the private credit market. And those are the businesses that Churchill likes to see. So again, their portfolio on average is, is generating between 65 and 75 million of cash flow. And those businesses, again, may have been go going away from us in a, in a more um, functional syndicated market, but we're seeing more opportunities because of that, that dislocation currently. And Kelly, can you just take a minute to uh, <clears throat> explain what you mean by syndicated market for those clients who are joining us? Sure. So it really goes back to, to Ken's initial point with the banks and the bank's role in the leverage lending market. So the syndicated market is a place where loans are issued, typically with banks running the process. And when a bank issues a loan, say it's a $500 million loan, their main purpose and intent is to sell that loan to other investors. They don't wanna hold that $500 million loan. They wanna syndicate it, which is where that term comes from, the syndicate, they don't wanna sell it. And so in that transaction in a $500 million loan, you may have somewhere between 30 and 40 lenders buying little pieces of that loan. So you've got a very disparate lender group and it's a very transactional way to do business. We at Churchill are a relationship lender. So we're choosing these businesses and these private equity sponsors distinctly of who we want to transact with. And if we are going to lend 200 or 300 or $400 million to a business, we're gonna hold that loan. We're not gonna sell it. We're not gonna look to, to downsize it. We wanna hold it and we wanna work through that loan and own that loan through the duration of that private equity sponsor owning that business. So it's a very two very different ways to approach lending. Yeah, I would say also that when you think about the fundamentals in the liquid loan market, again, historically larger companies, historically uh, those companies will go out will go out and get a rating, and the, that market will be traded, right? So the buyers may buy they might buy into the initial deal that's being sold by an investment bank, maybe a mutual fund, maybe uh, you know other loan funds that would be a buyer of that deal, but they could just as easily sell that deal six months later. So it's a traded market. It's a tradable market. It's a market where investors come in and out. There's really no no visibility and ultimate consistency on the holders to the company. 
In the case of the direct lending market, the private credit market, when we make a loan, we expect to hold that loan to maturity. We are fundamentally focused on the credits, and the, the, the credit quality, the fundamental covenants for that company. And we expect to, to own it and have a relationship with that company for the life of the loan. So think of it as one market, the liquid large cap market is really a tradable market. It's a, it's a, a market that um, you know has uh, very transactional oriented. Uh, versus the direct lending market, the private credit market, that's a very relationship driven. And once we've made that loan, you know, we're with that company to, to help that company grow and 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 continue to to um, expand its business. So it's a very different dynamic in terms of how we we invest. That's excellent. Thank you for for diving in there a little bit deeper. And we saw when thinking about the difference between sort of circling back up a little bit, bonds, more traditional bonds and private lending. Um, you know, 2022 was a great example of a year when bonds did pretty poorly. Uh, they did not play the traditional role in the portfolio. Can private credit play, fill that role going forward? How do you see the interplay there with, with private credit? Sure, um, what we've been seeing uh, certainly uh, from wealth advisors um, as they talk to their clients about how they should think about alternatives more broadly, and in particular private credit, is that the old 60-40 model is, is pretty rapidly giving way to what I would call a 60-20-20 model, M meaning um, yes, equities are important, and yes, working with a manager to, to, to be invested in, in growth opportunities, very important, of course, public equities have liquidity. Um, and yes, there was a place for bonds uh, and long-term investments in a portfolio, but increasingly investors are saying, gee, institutional investors have access to private credit, private equity, private investment, alternative investments. Um, clearly, long-term, they drive outsized returns, certainly from the top managers. Um, how can we get access? How can we get access to those same alternative investments, those same private credit investments that historically have been only available to the largest institutional investors, the pension funds, the endowments. For example, we at Churchill have 1,700 investors globally and, and across our platform have over 300 institutional investors that invest in our funds. So, you know, individual investors now are saying, well, gee, how do we get access to these high quality, directly originated alternative investments? And Increasingly, um, wealth advisors are working with managers like ourselves to create investment structures, investment vehicles that provide that asset, access. And that's exactly what PCAP is. So I would say today, more than ever, uh, we're seeing you know, individual investors look to have some diversification <clears throat> in their portfolio by uh, adding uh, private credit to their investment mix. Um, and um, not at all atypical to see um, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of a portfolio be invested in alternatives. Um, and, and I would say that is, is the norm. And if you think about it, in a rising interest rate environment, our loans are all floating rate, right, right? So if you look at um, our investment funds or even PCAP, for example, yielding 12 percent, right, in a, in a rising rate environment. So the yield on our investment funds has gone up about 500 basis points since rates started increasing. So unlike a bond fund that has fixed rate investments and obviously could suffer a diminution in principal value as rates rise, um, particularly a high yield bond fund, for example, in the case of our funds, our loan, our loan yields are rising with inflation and have performed very well through uh, both COVID and in fact, uh, through this rising rate environment. And I think as investors see that, they see the performance of our portfolios, that gives them further confidence that look, this is a good place to invest a portion of my portfolio to get great current income. And at the same time, more conservative structures and a floating rate character, you know, a floating rate uh, dynamic in the underlying interest rates. And, and I'm and curious, Ken. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to quickly ask with that floating rate aspect, as interest rates are higher, how does that impact the companies within the fund, their ability to renegotiate terms or um, 
not likely default, but if it's, is that on the table in higher yep. interest rate environments? No, that's, a, that's a great question. And what we have seen is that the more conservative lenders like ourselves, and we are known within our industry as probably being one of the most conservative private credit managers in the industry. Uh, we've experienced extraordinarily low loss rates over our 17 year history, averaging about five basis points a year over 17 years. So we've had a very low historical loss rate. And, um, and, and so you look at the portfolio, you look at the quality of the manager's portfolio in the current environment. That gives you kind of an insight into how they've underwritten the credits, how conservative were they, how is their portfolio performing, not just what their yield look like looks like, because that may look very good. As you said, in a rising rate environment, 12% sounds great, but what's the portfolio quality look like? And, and that's, I think, where we as a firm really shine. What you see is that the top managers have stayed quite conservative. And so, you know, for us, for example, historically, we've underwritten our transactions with a very conservative profile um, typically around three times coverage of interest expense to cash flow. So a company's cash flow over their interest expense, typically about three times coverage to their actual interest expense. So even today with higher rates in our portfolio, the average coverage of interest expense is still over two times. So, you know, looking at the portfolio gives you a very good indicator of what the underlying you know, um, the underlying approaches of the manager that you may be talking to. And in our case, one of the things that's happened is that we've been very successful in raising capital over the last several years because our investors have seen how our portfolio has performed. And, and so you're absolutely right to ask the question. It's not just what's your current yield, but actually what's the quality of the portfolio and how have those companies been able to handle the higher interest rates? Did you invest in more conservative structures so that even with a rising rate environment, those companies can still comfortably handle the interest expense? Or did you kind of push the envelope, if you will, and invest in more aggressive credits that may be having problems, you know, handling the uh, the current interest rate environment? Thankfully, in our case, um, our portfolio continues to perform extremely well. We're very, very pleased about that. And it's resulted in, you know, our fundraising continued to be very, very strong as a firm we've raised over six and a half billion dollars this year alone in new capital. And it's a direct result of our institutional investors and individual investors seeing the performance of our portfolio. And Kelly um, sits as the portfolio manager for PCAP and she can you know, certainly give you more color on PCAP's portfolio. But I think in general, as a firm, we've really benefited from that dynamic. Absolutely. And I was gonna say, that's, a, that's another important distinction between a bond portfolio and an allocation to private credit in your portfolio. A bond portfolio is going to have a lot of overlap, right? There's a finite number of bonds out there, and those portfolios are constructed by managers, and, and they're often trading in and out of a similar set of bonds. A private credit manager's portfolio is completely unique and distinct, and that's why the alignment specifically with the private credit manager that you're choosing is so important to understand their track record, to Ken's point with our low loss history, how we're selecting these transactions, how we're structuring our transactions. And as a result, the performance of Churchill's funds in general, but particularly PCAP is incredibly strong. When we look at the PCAP portfolio in particular, we have over a hundred borrowers in the portfolio. We specifically structure these portfolios to be very diverse. So if we are in a situation, very rare, but if we're in a situation where one borrower in the portfolio starts to have some sort of financial distress, it's not gonna have a significant impact on the fund's performance because that hold position is less than 1%. So when we look at over the 100 borrowers in the PCAP portfolio today, very, very strong performance to Ken's point, interest coverage over two times on average across the portfolio, which is very remarkable given the fact that interest rates have increased over 500 basis points from the date a lot of these transactions were, were put on the books at Churchill. So very, very strong performance, no defaults in the portfolio today, no requests from borrowers to amend covenants. It's, it's really, really performing incredibly well. Well, I see where that was, we're up on time um, here and that was a wealth of concentrated information. So I'm glad that this was recorded so that even our clients who are able to join live can re-listen to it. 
Um, Kelly, Ken, thank you both so, so much for your time again today. And uh, you were just a wealth of information. So we really appreciate it. And if any of our clients have follow-up questions, we were trying to kind of sprinkle in questions that popped up that we saw throughout the, the conversation. But if anyone has anything else, please don't hesitate to reach out to your advisor. Uh, thank you both so much. No, our pleasure. Thank Absolutely. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your interest. Take Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.